Blessing the song of invitation will be 655. 655. <laughs> We appreciate the presence of each of you here this evening, and as we go into our study this evening, I'm reminded of what Brother Crow presented to us in the morning lesson. He was dealing with the death of Christ and the benefits of that death of Christ, especially as it related to the purchase price that was paid for our sins and the justice of God that uh, God applies to each of his creation and what they receive as far as benefits eternally will be dependent upon them as they obey or do not obey God's word. Tonight I'm going to be dealing not with the death of Christ but with the resurrection of Christ and I would encourage each of you to turn in your Bibles if you have them with you to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As we look at this chapter I'm going to be dealing with a textual study tonight. So as we move from verse to verse, you'll be able to follow me. And hopefully, when we reach the end of this chapter, you will have benefited as, as I hope uh, I have benefited from the study of it myself. So as we consider this particular subject, the resurrection is one of the most important events that took place in history. Uh, as we look at Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, he said, Concerning the Son, His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, how? By the resurrection from the dead. So, Paul, in writing to the Romans here, says this is an important thing an event in history because it proves the Son of God and one of many proofs but one of the most important proofs that there is. I've heard many lessons dealing on the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of mankind in general but this is one of the ones I enjoy the most because it's so detailed in its uh, presentation here. So what I'm going to be doing tonight is giving you first of all a, a brief outline of the chapter and then we'll move into it verse by verse and consider some statements in regard to those things that Paul has written to the Corinthians. First of all in chapter 15 we have the first 11 verses which are talking about the gospel and the good news of the resurrection. Moving from verse 11 then to verse 12 on through 19, we have the importance of the resurrection. Paul deals with this in some length. Verses 20 through 23, he deals with the reality of the resurrection. Verses 24 through 34, he deals with the timing of the resurrection. From verse 35 through 50, he deals with the nature of of the resurrected body. Verses 51 through 57, he deals with the mystery of the resurrection. And then in verse 58, the encouragement and the comfort that we can get from a study of this particular subject. So with that brief outline to work from, we'll look first at the first 11 verses, which deal with the gospel and the good news of the resurrection. Reading from verse 1, we see, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. The gospel, the very word gospel, means good news. And so, as we consider the term gospel, keep that in mind as far as the definition is concerned, and you'll see why it's considered to be good news when you see what it relates to here. In verse 1, for one thing, he indicates that he had preached the gospel unto them. 
Also in that same verse, he says that they had received the gospel, that good news that he had presented. And also, it's that which they lived by. And so, with that in mind, moving to verse 2, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So, as we look at verse 2 then, we can see that we are saved by the gospel. How are we saved by the gospel? By the facts that Paul will give. And as we consider those facts, uh, we see then that this gospel that he's speaking of here involves those facts in verses 3 and 4. So let's read verse 3 and 4. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. Keep that fact in mind. The death of Christ. And that he was buried, and they rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So you got the death and the burial. Then, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, after that he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. As we consider then these verses here, we see from verses 3 and 4 that the gospel involves the facts of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And had it not been for the death of Christ, we would have no hope today. But that would have been futile without the resurrection associated with that death of Christ. If Christ had just died, he would have been no different than any of the rest of us, which as we approach the end of our stay here on this earth, we know that death will eventually claim us. And it's something which as a Christian, a faithful Christian, we ought to look forward to it, really. Uh, many times we don't have that attitude toward it, but we should. And as we consider then what it means for the resurrection to be associated with Christ's death, He rose from the dead. No doubt about it. As we looked to uh, what I just read a few moments ago from verse 5, He said that Peter saw Him, and then he was seen by the twelve, the twelve apostles. Furthermore, verse 6 tells us that he was seen by approximately 500 people. <coughs> now, if he'd, if he'd been seen <coughs> excuse me, by one or two people, two people would have been enough to be factual as far as witness of the events concerned. But it wasn't just two people. Nearly 500 people. That's a lot of people. And they were knowledgeable of Jesus as he lived. And then they saw him alive after the resurrection. After he had died on the cross. After they'd seen him put into the grave. And then here's that man walking among them again. There's no doubt of the significance of that miracle that God brought forth as he came forth from the grave to rise again and if one man can come forth from the grave that opens the door for the rest of us to have that same uh, opportunity when the time comes. Moving on, after he had been seen by some 500 brethren it says that he was seen by James and the twelve, verse 7. Then Paul goes into his own situation. So let's read verse 8. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due season, or due time. Paul considered himself to be fortunate in the fact that he had had the opportunity to see Christ. Uh, not like the 500, in a different way. And as you read the accounts of Paul's conversion, particularly in chapter 9 of the book of Acts, and also uh, 
chapter 16 and on 22 and, and see the events listed there. Paul said he was the last of the apostles to be called. And he was one born out of due time or due season. So he was privileged in his way of looking at it that he had had the opportunity to be able to see Christ and know him on a personal basis as he was on the road to Damascus. In verse 9, we see that he says, For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle. Why? Because he says, I persecuted the church of God. Paul had done the best that he could to stamp out Christianity in every sense of the word. As a faithful Jew, he thought he was required to do that by God as far as being instructed to do so. And he tried the best that he could. Paul was a very experienced Jew as far as his training was concerned. As far as his application of his training, he was of the strictest sense. That is, one of the Pharisees, they tried to go by the letter of the law as far as they could see it. And Paul was one of them. And he was rising in significance and importance as time went along. And one of the things he was doing was trying his best to conquer Christianity, which was a constant problem to the Jews of that day. Moving on to verse 10, Paul writes, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was uh, bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. As Paul looked at the situation that he was in with God, he said that God had been very merciful to him. And so recognizing what God had done for him, he worked even harder than most did in order to, in some way, pay God back for what he had done for him. Of course, you never can pay back God for what he does for us. But Paul tried the best that he could. In verse 11, Therefore, in other words, based upon what we've just read in the previous verses, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. It was through the preaching of the good news of the resurrection then by numerous witnesses that caused the Corinthians to believe and have the hope of salvation that they did. We move into the second portion of our study this evening then in verses 12 through 19, dealing with the importance of the resurrection. In verse 12, we read as follows. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? There were those in Paul's day, especially of the Jews, that said there was no resurrection. That's an impossibility. And yet Paul, in writing here, says, How are there some among you that say there is no resurrection? And so in the following verses, we're going to see him set out the facts and proof that the resurrection was factual. In verse 13, he shows the following. He says, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Christ didn't rise if what the Jews said was true. But when you have somebody that was seen by close to 500 people that saw him alive after his death and burial, there's no doubt as far as the actual fact was concerned. And so we move to verse 14 through 16. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because you have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. What value was it for the apostles to preach 
about Christ, his death and burial and resurrection if it didn't actually occur. It'd be without any purpose whatsoever. It would be false, first of all. And our faith, as it uses the term our there in the text, and also our faith in our time, it would be futile. If there was no resurrection of the dead, our faith would be in vain as well as those people of that day. Verse 17, he says, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, nor is without value. You are yet in your sins. If our faith is vain, then we are still without the remission of our sins. And Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost, for example, as the Jews were convicted of what they had done in, in killing the Messiah. They recognized that they were guilty of what they had done. And they asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? And they were told to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So that preaching would have been futile. It would have been vain without any purpose if Christ did not raise from the dead. And he said, with that in mind, if it's vain, then you are yet in your sins. Can you enter heaven with your sins upon you? No. You must have the remission of sins, and you can't do it on your own, because no one of us is without sin in our lives. One sin would convict us in the sight of God, and without the blood of Christ, we would be lost eternally. Moving to verse 18 then. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. This is one of the problems that the people of that day had. They were concerned about those that had died already, especially those that had died as Christians. And without the remission of sins, those who died as Christians had no hope of eternal life. It's just that simple. And so we move to verse 19, and he says in verse 19, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. In other words, if eternal life is nothing more than what we have in this life, now it's true that as a Christian we have benefits over those around us when we become Christians because we have a better way of life than the world around us. When you consider the uh, problems that are involved with drugs and, and particularly alcohol and some of the uh, various drugs that are currently on the market and being seem like they multiply more and more. If in this life then that's the only hope we have is what eternal life would be as we see it in this life, surely we are of all men most miserable because our hope for the future that we have read from the scriptures would be of no value to us. But looking in verse 20 then, we begin another section which deals with the reality of the resurrection. Uh, Paul in writing this wants us to realize just how important this is as far as the resurrection is concerned. And so in verse 20 we, we read this, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Show, Paul shows that the resurrection was not just a story, not just a fairy tale, it's real. And he realized that Christ was the first fruits, that is, the first of the harvest, so to speak, and that others would follow that first fruit being harvested. Christ being the first fruit then, as I mentioned earlier, he set the example of what could happen to the rest of us. His body was changed. He went to the heavenly realm to be with the God, his Father. Now, as we look at verse 20, we see that he became 
the first fruits. Let's read verse 21 through 23 now. But since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. We look back to the beginning of time, particularly to Genesis 3, and he relates to Adam's sin. Just as Adam's sin showed the possibility that others could and would sin, so it was that Christ's resurrection showed the possibility that others could be resurrected when Christ returns. And that's the wording as it's given here, particularly in verse 23. Every man according to his own order. The order would be the order in which the resurrection would relate to mankind. Christ the first and then the others to follow. And we'll see more about what that involved as we go on into the next portion of our lesson which covers a greater span of verses and particularly now from verse 24 on through verse 34 relating to the timing of the resurrection. Paul answers the question of when will the resurrection be? Let's look at verse 24. He speaks in verse 23 that uh, they that are Christ at his coming and so then as we move to 24 it says then cometh the end when cometh the end then then when when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God even the Father so when is the end coming the end is coming when Christ returns not physically to this earth the Bible speaks of him returning in the air and those of the dead rising from the earth, rising from the grave, those that are living rising as well, receiving a new body that would be fit to be applicable to life in the spiritual realm with God the Father and all the heavenly hosts there. So as we consider this end, the end comes when Christ returns according to verse 24. Now that doesn't coincide very well with some of the uh, religious doctrine we hear today. Partic particularly those that are premillennial in their teaching because if the end comes when Christ comes that doesn't give time for a kingdom to be set up on this earth. As many are teaching religiously today they look for a kingdom to be established in the area of Jerusalem the temple to be rebuilt, Christ to return and operate as king over his kingdom. That's not what this passage tells us. The end that comes when Christ comes. All right, let's go to the next verse. <clears throat> In verse 25, For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. That's an interesting verse. If he must reign till he put all enemies under his feet, and he is going to reign until the end comes, and the end comes when time ends, then we see that he is currently reigning. Otherwise, this verse makes no sense whatsoever. If he must reign until he had put all enemies under his feet. Death is the last enemy to be conquered. Jesus conquered death when he died and rose from the grave. When the resurrection took place, he conquered death. When all of us are raised and go to be with him in the air and in the heavenly realm from there to eternity, then death is conquered. There's no time for any kingdom upon this earth, any earthly kingdom. Christ is reigning, and he must reign. So he's currently reigning, 
until the end of time comes. Those who look for him to reign upon this earth are not relating to this passage the way they should. Verse 26 tells us that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And so that's death as it affects all mankind. No more are we involved with death as we, as we know it to be in this life. In verse 27 then, there's an exception given here. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. God is the only exception that's given here of the word all things. All things being put under Christ's feet, God the Father was not put under Christ's feet, but all other things were. Uh, God being the only exception here. We move to verse 26. It shows that the last enemy is death. 27, God being the exception. And now 28, Christ then at verse 28 will be in subjection to the Father. Christ was over, ruling over his kingdom up to this point in time as we see the facts given. But when the resurrection comes and death is conquered by it, the kingdom will be turned over to the Father by Christ. And God will be in control and Christ will be in subjection to the Father at that point. The Godhead will actually be once again unified and together as it was in the beginning when creation took place. When you go back and read the events of creation in the book of Genesis, you see the term us used, plural. That is God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as we look at that then, we can see here that there comes a time in the future when the kingdom is tur turned back to the Father, that Christ will be in subjection to the Father in an even more direct way than he was upon the earth. And even upon the earth, he said he did, did the will of the Father. All right, the, moving to verse 29. 29 gives people a difficult time sometimes because of the interpretation that many are putting upon it. Let's read it. First of all, we need to take up what was at the end of verse 28. I'll just read verse 28 in its entirety. And when all things shall be subdued by him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all. Why are they then baptized for the dead? There are those who teach today that you can baptize today for someone who has already died. And this would enable them to have their sins remitted even though they had passed from this life. That's not what this passage is take, telling us. <clears throat> He's saying here, why are these people being baptized now as they look forward to the time when they will be dead and their, their souls, their bodies will be placed in the grave, their souls will return to the Creator who made them, according to Solomon's writings in the book of Ecclesiastes, so, as we consider this then, why would you and I be baptized now if there was no hope of a resurrection, if there was no hope that the dead don't rise? We wouldn't have any hope of, of being in heaven with the Heavenly Father and, and all the angels and all the saved of time. So, he says, why are they then baptized for the dead? That is, as they look forward to death after this life, they're looking forward to a time when they can receive the benefits 
of their actions upon the earth at this point. And you'll see that more as we see the next verse or two. So let's move on to that. In verse 30, And why stand you in jeopardy every hour? Who is he speaking of here? Well, he's speaking about the apostles in particular. If the dead are not raised, why are the apostles putting their lives in danger every day to preach the gospel? That's one of the biggest proofs of the resurrection uh, in addition to what we're dealing with here tonight is the fact that those apostles were not what you might say the most faithful of all individuals. When Christ was upon the cross, where were the apostles? Most of them scattered and went their way. But later, they came back to him and they lived faithfully, even putting their lives on the line. And that's L-I-N-E, not L-I-O-N, because some of them actually went to the lions themselves and were killed by the animals uh, as they were just treated without any consideration at all. Moving then to uh, verse 31 and 32, he says, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If after the men, after the manner of men, I have fought with beasts of Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat drink, and drink, for tomorrow we die. Sometimes we use the expression, eat, drink, and, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. Well, that's basically where it's coming from as far as this passage is concerned. But he's saying here that if after the manner of men he's, he's had to fight with the beasts of Ephesus even to the danger of being killed in the process, what advantage was it to me if, if I put my life in danger like that? If the dead don't rise and I have no hope of eternal life, what value was it to me? Let's just eat, drink, and be merry and enjoy what's here in this life and forget about the future because if the dead rise not, there is no future as far as our souls are concerned. So, moving on then to verse 33. In verse 33, he says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Other translations, some of them I use the word be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good morals. And both are true. Uh, good manners and good morals are, are corrupted by the association that we have with those that are living in sin about us and have no respect for God whatsoever. So in verse 33, don't listen to what you're being told by others that there is no resurrection. If that were true, you might as well eat, drink, and be merry. To listen to those in error, they would lead you into corruption. Corruption of, of your morality that you once had. Moving to verse 34 then. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Instead of listening to the error of those around you, Awake to righteousness, and we learn about righteousness from the Word of God, and avoid sin. Sin will destroy you. And so he's warning them against that possibility. We move to another portion of our lesson now, from verse 35 through 50, as he speaks about the nature of the resurrected body. Apparently some were questioning what kind of a body do we have when we're resurrected? And as we're considering that, let's read verse 35. But some will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Paul was trying to answer their questions, and he did so using an illustration 
coming from the agricultural realm of the, our lives here. In verse 36, for example, he says, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. As we think about planting a garden, planting a field as far as farmers are concerned, planting anything as seed is put into the ground and you do so with the hope that there will be something come forth from the ground. But the seed which we plant in the ground decays. You can go out a few days after planting, uh, we'll say a kernel of wheat or a kernel of corn and dig it up and it's already started to decay. But there's also something else you'll see there when you dig that up. You'll see a little tiny plant beginning to form there in the inside of that kernel. And if you let it grow, put it back in the ground and let it come forth, in a few days that green shoot will be coming up out of the ground. So as we see Paul's illustration here, Let's read verse 7 in association with what we just saw. And he says, That which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance be of wheat or of some other grain. So as you plant the grain, the seeds that you plant decay to make food for the new plant. And we see that taking place every day in farm life as we plant our crops and plant our gardens, even if you're planting things within your household as far as pot, potted plants and things like that. That which comes forth uh, is not that which you planted. In verse 38 he says, But God giveth it a body as it pleased him, and to every seed his own body. God gives a new body to the grain that you planted, and he does it based upon what he has chosen the arrangement to be by which it would act. In 39, then, he says, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another kind of beasts, another kind of fishes, and another kind of birds. So we look around us and we see that flesh is not the same. The flesh of our bodies that we have as humans is not the same as it is of beasts that grow around us. And as we look at those beasts and compare them with fish, fish do not have the same type of flesh that the uh, beasts do, such as your cows and horses and pigs and what have you. And the birds are different too. And Paul's stating this of with using an example which they were well familiar with, probably more so than we are because they were closer to the agricultural or farming type community of the day than we are now. In verse 40 then, let's read this and you'll see another comparison. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Reading verse 41, there is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. He's using this in another illustration by which they can see what the resurrection is going to be like. Because he said all flesh is not the same, neither are the things that are not flesh. Even the things around us as far as the celestial bodies in the heavens are different from one another. They have a different glory as he uses the term here. And so he reaches a conclusion here in the matter in verse 42. He says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. As we saw the seed planted in the ground, it was changed. And so is our resurrected body changed from what we have in the present life that we live. We will not be in the same body that we are now when we die and go to be with God. 
Our bodies as we die now are buried in the ground and our bodies decay over a period of time. But when our bodies are raised, that's not the body that comes forth. We have an incorruptible body coming forth to be with Christ. Verse 43 then. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, and it's raised in power. How long has it been since you looked in the mirror? Do you look the same as you did 30 years ago? 40 years ago? Some of us 50 or 60 years ago? No. Think of yourself as a teenager. You don't look the same now as you did when you were a teenager, for example. Move a little further back as a little baby child. Skin so soft, you want to just touch it with your fingers and feel of it. How cute those little rascals are uh, as they're first born into this world. They can be awfully selfish, but still you love them and want to care for them. You're not that way anymore. Time takes its toll upon us. And we have problems in life. Our bodies are wearing out as the years go by. We see our hair change color, for example. We see the wrinkles coming about. We see various other problems in our physical makeup that are taking place. And so, uh, we see the corruption that's taking place as far as our current bodies are concerned. I personally look forward to the time when I can have an incorruptible body, one that doesn't wear out, one that's suited to be with God eternally, without the, the, the trials and tribulations of this life. Put yourself in Ray Dodd's position as we think about an illustration here. Ray's gone through just untold suffering over the years. Even when Reba and I moved here 30 years ago, Ray was having trouble then. And some didn't expect him to live more than a year or two. And here it is 30 years later, he's still going through those same trials. I think Ray will look forward to a time after this life when we no longer have this corruptible body but one that's incorruptible. Verse 43 then, It is sown, that is the body, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it's raised in power. And so he describes that the bodies that die are not glorious, but the resurrected body will be a glorious body. Well, how will it look then? Let's look at verse 44 and 45. It's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. A natural or physical body is buried in the ground when we pass from this life. But when that body comes forth, it's not what it was when it went into the ground. It's raised a spiritual body, one that's suited to be with Christ. Let's look at verse 46 then. How be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. So the physical body is what we use now in this life. The spiritual body is what that which we use in eternity. And that's the reason for them being different from one another. As we look at verses 47 through 49 then, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are also they also that are earthy. And as and is the heavenly such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. We are made 
in the image of God. We also are basically in the image of Adam as our physical nature was similar is similar to what Adam's physical nature was. And this is that what she's saying here. We have an earthy image at the present life, but when we move from the time of the resurrection into the heavenly realm, then we have the image of the heavenly. John records what the image of the heavenly is like in chapter 3 and verse 2 of First John. He says we don't know definitely what uh, our bodies will be like when Christ returns and we are raised from the dead, but we know that we shall be like him and we shall see him as he is. So, what will our bodies look like in the resurrected form? John says they'll be like Christ, and that's about all I can tell you at the present time. <laughs> Moving to verse 50 then, we see an important fact here. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Basically, he's saying flesh and blood as we are living today cannot inherit the kingdom. We must be changed. We must go through this process of change which the resurrection involves to have that spiritual body which is like Christ, suited to be with Christ and all of the heavenly realm. Moving to verse 51 then. We start a new area and it deals with the mystery of the resurrection. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Not everyone in the world will die physically. We don't know when the end's going to come. We may still be living when the end comes. If it comes while we're living, we're among them that he's talking with here. We shall not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. All of us will be changed whether we're dead or not. If we're dead in the grave, our resurrected bodies will come forth as a new body from the grave to be with Christ. If we're living at that time, we have not yet passed from this life physically, then our bodies still will be changed. Otherwise, we would not be fit for uh, being in the presence of God. No one can see God and live according to the scriptures. No one can do it physically. Our bodies are not adapted to be able to do that. And so he's relating uh, to how we will not all sleep, but we shall all go through that change. This change will occur quickly, as we see in verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, as the last trump, the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. It's hard to really imagine what that's going to be like, but I guarantee you from the wording here, everyone's going to know that it's taking place when it comes. It'll be announced, as he says here, by the last trump, at which time everybody shall receive that incorruptible body. Looking to verse 53 then, he says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. We've talked about that at some length in the previous verses. Verse 54 and 55. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? At this point, death will be overcome, as I mentioned earlier. It will be overcome to be no more. Once a person reaches heaven, there is no concern for death anymore. He has reached the goal that he strove for in this life. In verse 56, he says, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Death was caused by sin, by Adam and Eve falling to sin in the garden. But now 
after Christ having been raised from the dead, we can do the same thing as Christ did, and the grave has lost the battle. Satan has lost his ability to hold us captive, and we can be with him, be with God throughout eternity. And so, uh, in verse 57, we see, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. God is to be thanked then for the gift of His Son, who made possible victory over death. And that's what Bill was relating to some in his lesson this morning, that we ought to give God thanks and credit for giving us the necessary purchase price for the sins that we have committed. Verse 58 is a summary of the whole passage here then. And as we read verse 58, we'll bring our lesson to a close here. He says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Because of the victory over death, we should encourage each other to remain faithful and abound in the work of the Lord. Notice he says, Be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Not just when you're young, but as you grow older as well. And as you develop opportunities and abilities more, use what you've got to the best of your ability. As we reach a point in age, of course, we are unable to do the physical things that we once did. But there are many of us that can do spiritual things in relation to teaching our fellow man uh, and encouraging them to live for God. As we think then about what we studied this evening, as Paul wrote this 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the resurrection of Christ has been proven by Paul and I hope that you have followed and been able to see Paul's proof as he's given it to us. He's proven Christ to be the Son of God. Christ overcame death and we can do likewise. Heaven awaits those of us who are faithful to God. And so the question comes to our mind then as we close our lesson. Are each of us ready for the resurrection when it comes? Have we done what the Bible says that we must do to be prepared for it? In Mark 16 and 16, it records that we must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. In Luke 13 and 3, it records that we must repent of our sins. Matthew 10, verses 32 and 3, records that we must confess Him before men in order for Him to be willing to confess us before the Father. In Mark 16, 16, it also records that we must be baptized to be saved. Baptized for the remission of sins, according to Acts 2 and verse 38. And then, as a closing passage, Revelation 2 and 10 relates to those of us that are saved as far as a point in time. Are we faithful from that point of time when we were baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins? Are we faithful unto death? Even if it involves death, we still must be faithful. Are you ready to meet Christ when this time comes? If so, fine. If not, then let's take what action is necessary to correct our situation. As we sing the invitation song, will you come?